And you've only had him for eight days, but I can tell you, quite smitten, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah, he's stolen my heart. I have absolutely no choice. I need to perform surgery today. Yes, he's eight days old. Yes, he's a high-risk anaesthetic. But I have no choice because without performing this procedure, he can't latch onto mum, he can't suckle milk, and unfortunately, he will end up starving. Is this the new recruit? It is. Oh, my God. In Richmond, Scott's day is beginning with one of the youngest and tiniest patients he's ever seen, an eight-day-old chihuahua puppy. Mm, puppy. Brought in by a very worried owner, Charlotte. He was born with a cleft lip and cleft palate. Oh, my God. Let's just have a look and say, oh, wow, OK. The deformed palate means every day of the little chihuahua's life has been a struggle. Oh, oh, sweetheart, you're already okay. looking hungry. Look, you're trying to eat your hot water bottle. Because he can't latch on to either his mum or a bottle, and he isn't putting on weight. At birth, the vet stitched up all the roof of his mouth and stitched up the hair lip, and the hair lip's just not holding. He's had to be restitched three times already. Something more permanent has to be done. With the temporary suture out, is he able to suckle at all? No. no. No, he can't. He hasn't got the vacuum that's needed to get the milk out. Yeah, I mean, look, he's already hungry, you can see. And she mate. There's now only one option left, more surgery, but this time under anaesthetic, a risky thing for such a young dog. Let's go into the consult room and we'll chat about this very fraught surgery we're going to have to do on you, little man. Come on, then. I have absolutely no choice. I need to perform surgery today. Yes, he's eight days old. Yes, he's a high-risk anaesthetic. But I have no choice because without performing this procedure, he can't latch onto mum, he can't suckle milk, and unfortunately, he will end up starving. Well, this type of patient and also this type of surgery is incredibly fraught and not something that we, we want to do. But in his case, if he doesn't have the surgery, he will basically fade away and starve yeah. to death. Yeah, the other possibility is that he can also aspirate the milk, breathe it in and die suddenly. And you've only had him for eight days, but I can tell you, quite smitten, aren't you? Yeah, he's stolen my heart. Absolutely in love with him. He's like a member of the family already. And I've been hand-rearing him for the last eight days. I'm so in love with him already. Well, I'm gonna take him downstairs and see the team. Say goodbye to your little man. Good boy. General anaesthetic for an eight-day-old puppy is never good. It's never something you want to do, but it really is his last hope. I'm just scared that he's not going to make it. Hi, guys. Hi. Hi. Right, so we've got a, a difficult job in our hands today, guys. So we're really going to have to keep our wits about us because you can just see the size of that hair lip. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's really sad. But now, unfortunately, the temporary sutures that were put in at birth, you can see, have just blown. And now he just can't clamp down. He can't just get the suction that he needs to, right. to suckle properly. Because you can see there's actually a little tiny, tiny, tiny little hole just there, like a pinhead. But still, yeah. it'll be too big, and he won't make it. So we do need to perform an anaesthetic and surgery on this guy. Nurses Nathan and Reagan will assist with the challenging task of anaesthetizing such a tiny patient. It's a anaesthetist nightmare, that is. Yeah, well, I think it's anyone's nightmare. Yeah, you know, a young, young animal, old animal, we all know that they are the riskiest. Henry won't make it if we don't do this. All right, let's start the process. Just a little bit of anaesthetic. Everyone cross your fingers and toes and paws. Because we have to do surgery on his head, mm. we can't have his head in a mask. No. Mm. So when we get down to a point where we think that he's deep enough, we're going to quickly flip him round, mm -hmm. okay? And then Reagan, if you can extend his head, and then I'm going to hold down his tongue and try and get the tube in. All right. First task to be tackled is to try and navigate the anaesthetic. Can we place a tube down his throat? Can we place a tube in his nostril? Let's give it a go. So um, you're going to pull the mask off, and you're going to spin him round to me, okay? Ready? Three, two, one, go. Scott is hoping a narrow tube down the throat will be the most effective way to administer anaesthetic to his tiny patient. Puppy. But it's proving more difficult than he thought. 
a tiny little head, it has a really big tongue and gets in the way of our ability to look and see the larynx and pass that tube through. Yeah, just going to have to gas him down a bit more, it's too light. What is he on now, is he on five? Four, he's on four. So put him up to five. I think what we'll do this time around is we'll just try straight onto this. So we'll go into his nose mm -hmm. and try this. Because he's so small, he's got such a fast metabolism. So he's quickly removing the anaesthetic from his system. So he's giving us such a tiny little window to perform this micro surgery. It is really proving tough. Okay, okay. let's try again. Attempt number 52. <laughs> Sure, but maybe. I know it's so difficult to tell, but can you see the bag moving, Rady? No. Oh, wait, actually. It's like it's sort of working, but not completely. So, yeah, so I'm going to take that out and we're just going to try and mask. Oh, that's really... Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so the new plan is basically can't get the tube down and he doesn't seem to be tolerating the nasal tube either, so we're going to keep him nice and deep. You're going to just put it over his nostril. I'm going to scrape. We're yeah. going to put it back on. Okay. All right. The pressure really is on Nathan and Reagan. They're the ones that are responsible for the anaesthetic, maintaining that and ensuring that he recovers from it. So it is quite a high pressure procedure. He's a tiny puppy. So I'm just going to scrape the edges, OK? And then we'll put him back on the mask. When we're all happy again, and Nathan, you think he's deep enough, then I'll be putting the sutures in. Okay. All right. All right, let's go for it, everyone. Ready? Three, two, one, go. With the anaesthetic now finally working, Scott can clean up the pup's lip and at the base of his nose. He can then place sutures to permanently hold the edges together. Take our time, control our nerves, and we'll go back in. His heart's beating nice and strongly throughout, so in as much as it's not very nice to hear him cry, it's better that than him not survive. So a little bit of pain for long-term gain. Sorry, baby. We can have to do it one suture at a time. Mm, puppy. Never had to do surgery in bites of five seconds before. No, this is crazy, but it's gonna be done. Yeah. yeah, difficult. Just need to keep telling ourselves we're doing it for the right reasons. He won't survive unless we do this, so I'm sure he'll thank us eventually. Yeah. Just if we want to do the right job, I know that it's tough, but I think we need to just put one more suture just on the inside. So if we guess it done one last time, then that should be it. OK. So after the speed surgery and those little windows that I was able to place the sutures, I'm actually really happy with the cosmetic result. And we're done. The lips have come together. I feel that now he will be able to produce suction in order to feed for mum, and hopefully he'll go on to grow up to be a nice little chihuahua puppy. Bless him. He makes the cutest noises, doesn't he? Oh, man, he wouldn't go to sleep, and I feel like I need to now. That was tense. We've put three sutures in exactly where they need to be. He now has a nostril. He now has a fully formed hard palate. The fact that he fought us so much on the anaesthetic that he was screaming blue murder at points, just shows his character and that will really bode well for the future of this little guy. Yeah, gotta love him. <laughs> we did it. <laughs> Here he is. Upstairs, it's been an agonizing wait for owner Charlotte. So literally just out of surgery and it was very, very challenging, but he is as tough as nails. Now you can see why I want you to do it. Yeah. He's got such fight. He really does. <laughs> so we'll be taking the suture out in, well, maybe 10 days, two weeks. We'll see how it goes. We've put a non-absorbable one in there, so it will stay for as long as we feel it's necessary Brilliant. until he's just a bit stronger and a bit bigger. Brilliant. But right now he's done great. I think you need yeah. to name him. Why don't we call him Cliff? Cliff. Yeah. Yeah. Now to get him home, get him on mum, get him feeding, get him back to bright and alert like he normally is. You guys better get off. He needs to go and have a drink, and I think you need one too. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Thank you. <laughs> All right, then, Charlotte. Take care, sweetheart. And you. Bye. Bye, little man. Oh, someone's home. Hello. Hi. Oh, wow. <laughs> a little handful of cute there. 
A few days later, Scott is making an important house call to check on tiny cleft palate patient Cliff. So that's proud mum Dolly, yeah? It is. Hello. So. Hello, you about to feed your babies? Cliff's holding his own with his brother and sister. He may be the smallest in the litter, but he's certainly not the quietest. But I can see at the same time that those sutures and just the uh, abnormality that he's suffered with is going to mean that long term he's going to struggle to latch on and consume yeah. as much food as his brother and sister. So I would suggest that we do kind of supplement him with a little bottle from time yeah, to time. Yeah, definitely. I think yeah. you should say that. Ah, I think you no. should do the honours with this one. Oh, yes, please. Look at this. <laughs> Some. It's a really wonderful, special moment when you get to bottle feed a puppy because they are looking at you like their mum. They're pouring at you with their feet, trying to sort of pressurise the milk as if they were latched on to mum still, and it's a very special moment for me. Well, I think if this feed's anything to go by, he won't be long before he's catching up with his brother and sister. No. Hey, little man. No, no time at all. Hey. She's not actually from Bondi. She's from out of, out of Burke. I am a doctor and I do at a health clinic out there every couple of weeks. GP Catherine Hutt has arrived at the Bondi clinic with a very unusual patient. I heard about this premature lamb that was going to get tapped on the head. I know, and apparently she was just very small and had been born in the stockyards and wasn't likely to live. So of course, <laughs> once I'd heard about her, my very tolerant team stopped off on our way home from the clinic and picked her up and here she is. I don't know how many flying sheep there are, but she actually did very well. But after two weeks in the city, Amelia is struggling. Poodle cross, is it? <laughs> really nice try. <laughs> Hello, you're cute, aren't you? Where do you pick up the, the lamb nappies? I've never actually seen the nappies with a hole in the back for the tail. <laughs> well, they're custom made, okay. aren't they? We custom make them every morning. Um, aisle three at your local supermarket. That's right. And the diarrhoea she's had. You, you don't really want to no, see this. See the technical name for that is, is scouring. Scours is essentially another word for severe diarrhoea, but it's diarrhoea with a nasty effect. It dehydrates them, it takes away their electrolytes. <laughs> and it means they're not absorbing energy and scours. It's probably the number one cause of mortality, of, of death in, in young lambs and in calves. All right, well, we need to fix it. Yeah, we do. <coughs> Ooh, these ugly abscess here, just beside the bottom. You feel better after, really, okay? Let's just help you. Now, just like a human baby, the smaller they are, the more fragile they are. She's been born premature and then missed out on her mum's milk. All those important antibodies have just bypassed her. She's never had them. So she's very alone in this world. I'm gonna give her a, a chalky liquid. Okay. Just to try and calm down her gut and, mm. and settle it so she's not producing all that diarrhea. Mm. Oh. No, not loving it. <laughs> Chris gives Amelia a vaccination and antibiotics, but he's worried it's only a temporary solution. Samples will be sent to the lab to try and pinpoint what bacteria is causing Amelia's serious infections. As a doctor, Catherine's done a pretty good job getting Amelia to this point, getting through those tough first few days. But then when you see just how severe those scales are and how severe those abscesses are, you can see that she does need help. They both need help. Well, being a doctor, you do see some incredibly tough things, but um, and you'd think you'd be a bit immune to it and it wouldn't get to you, but her, she's just got to me. I'm just, I just love her and, um, and she's just the most special little thing, so I am a bit worried now. Amelia's test results are back and her infection's been caused by a bacteria called Pseudomonas. Now, they only get this infection when their immune system's given up the fight. And that's because she never got her mother's milk. She never got those antibodies that were going to protect her for the rest of her life. The fact is, if we don't boost up her immune system, then a nastier bug, a deadly bug, is going to come along and take her out. Sure, we can give her antibiotics now to fix this problem, but long term, we need a permanent solution. And I reckon I've got an idea. Chris is now on the road to the Golden Ridge Animal Farm to carry out his plan. We're going to find an adult sheep and actually take some blood from her 
and take all those antibodies with it and transfer those antibodies from the blood into little Amelia. It works in foals, it works in calves, and I'll bet you it'll work in lambs as well. Now, where are our sheep? Uh, they're up this way, so we'll go for a walk up here and we'll have a look. Elisa, who looks after the mixed bunch of residents here, is hoping to find Chris a suitable blood donor. So I, I guess we need sort of a, an older one. Yeah. Preferably a mother that, that might even have some antibodies of her own. Yeah, I've got a couple there with lambs at the moment, right. so we should be able to find one. Perfect. Did you all want to help, do you? She's got lambs at the moment. Yeah, great. It's very kind of you, you know that? She's very good. Yeah. This might just look like some sheep's blood, but it means so much more to Amelia. It's full of antibodies, which are going to go into Amelia's system and essentially give her a future. And thank you. Oh, Mum. It's hard on you, isn't it? What's her name? Barbie. Barbie. Good old Barbie stepped up, did her a bit, and she's the hero. She'll make all the difference. So now Barbie's blood's actually settled, you can see what I'm after. It's this clear golden fluid that's sitting on the top. That is full of proteins and full of antibodies. It's called plasma, and that's what needs to go from here into little Amelia. Doesn't sound like Amelia. Oh, <laughs> hello, you, Amelia, you've grown. <laughs> <laughs> Hi Chris, Hi. how are you? Come in. Good to see you. <laughs> hey Amelia. Okay, we are in. I'll give this over the course of about five or ten minutes. Just to minimise any risk of this really protein rich, antibody rich fluid overwhelming a system and, and really sending her into a bit of a shock state. Well, I think it's a pretty amazing idea. If it works, fantastic. Anything that's going to help her. She's not quite three weeks old yet, so there's still a way to go before I'm confident that she's going to be all right on her own. Amelia, we're done. So how are we going to know if it works? It's almost a case of no news is good news. I mean, if she doesn't get any infections, then you know it's working. Go and hurry, aren't you? With the transfusion administered, Catherine's now trying to negotiate as much time as she can with Amelia. The plan now is to continue feeding her the milk, but her focus really has to shift from milk to grass at some stage. Now, you're supposed to be eating grass. I think she prefers carpet. I think we're probably looking at about six weeks from now that we can start to think about moving her away onto a farm. I don't know who's going to be worse off, her or me, because I don't know how I'm going to cope. Catherine might say six years, but six weeks is probably going to be about right. I think we can stretch that a little. It's grass. <laughs> In Sydney, mobile vet Audrey and nurse Brianna are on their way to check up on a very special little patient. Look at my little boy. Hi, baby. Hi. You look very bright. <laughs> Two weeks ago, cat lover Zarima rescued a four-week-old kitten after he was found by the side of the road with a shocking deformity. We'll go check you out. Do you want to come into the van and I'll have a good look at him in there? I don't know if mum had left him behind or someone would have just unfortunately maybe just dumped him because he did have a really big swelling on the left side of his stomach and it was the swelling was actually almost as big as him. How's our baby? Mm -hmm. He has grown. Uh, he's grown half. Because I remember I I fit him in my eat. whole hand before. Honestly, as soon as I took him to um, the hospital, they did tell me that there was no chance. Um, and the kindest thing to do would be to let him go. And then I thought, no, I, I wanted to hear from Audrey. And of course, straight away, she was in there and she's like, no, we're gonna do everything we can for him. We're gonna give the surgery a go and see if he can pull through. Really, really worried because he's got this big swelling inside his thigh and we're quite concerned that it's a hernia and some of his bladder has come through 
and his small intestine. So we're really worried. We have to go back into surgery, have a look, see if we can pop it all back in. Uh, and hopefully give him a fighting chance. Everything just looks massive in this baby. Mm. I actually didn't think he was going to make it at all. Initially, we thought he maybe had a small tear in his abdominal muscles, and that's where all the organs were herniating through. Once we went inside, it was a completely different story. We actually found he had not much muscle on one side, and the muscle had completely torn away from the wall. Uh, so it was a pretty big surgery, but we got there in the end. The good news is all his... Um, hernia repair, so that muscle repair that we did on his abdominal ward, that's all stayed because I can feel that's intact. And there's no, you know, intestines or bladder coming through like before. But that fluid's coming from somewhere, we need to find out where. While the kitten appears to be recovering well from his surgery, there's a new problem. And we've been monitoring this for the last two weeks and noticed that there is a bit of fluid. Not sure where it's coming from, but I'm really worried it may be the first surgery not working out or is there something else that's happening. We tested it the other day and it did come back very suspicious as, as urine. Um, so there's a small tear in the bladder and it would be small because it builds up over a couple of weeks. Um, we've got to go in and repair it, yeah. It's always a little bit of a blow, you know, when you've done this big surgery and they've been recovering so well and then you hit this hiccup. Um, but I think, you know, the main aim is trying to find out what's going on and, and fix it as soon as we can. Auntie Audrey and Auntie Brie are gonna look after yeah, you. I'm gonna look after you, okay? So Zarima is a really nice girl. She rescues all these kittens and spends her own money, you know, repairing them and making them better. So I think maybe she's called him little boy because she doesn't want to get too attached, but she's completely in love with him. I come across so many animals that need help, or especially cats. There's so many stray cats and they don't speak. They don't have a voice. So we need to do it for them and I want to give him a good life. I will keep you updated. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Aww. Brie. Oh. You're a brave boy. Lawson was very brave. You're dying to come out, don't you? At Audrey's partner practice in Sydney, little boy's feeling a bit unsure about the next stage of his treatment. Oh, oh no. <gasps> you don't want to come out. I was really nervous and a little bit emotional before because, you know, just seeing how much mum loves him and, you know, how much he's been through and him being so little. Um, but now I think I'm on that role of let's find out what's going on. Let's get him better. So we're just going to do some plain x-rays first. I just want to see how everything's sitting in the abdomen since the last big surgery. There's too much fluid in there. There's so see. much fluid. To have urine floating around in the abdomen means that there's a tear somewhere or there's some sort of leakage coming from his urinary tract, whether it's his bladder or the tubes coming in and out of the bladder, we just don't know. So because he's so tiny, he's so young, um, his body condition, you know, he's very small, the anaesthetic is always risky. Um, so we just got to watch him closely, try and make it as safe as we can. So I've popped an anaesthetic tube in um, that just makes sure that we can keep his depth under control. And then once I'm happy with how he's going, I'm actually going to catheterize his penis into his bladder and start injecting some dye to have a look. <laughs> it's like threading a needle but harder because they've got this little bend. Um, so you've got to maneuver it really mm. gently. And then obviously everything's minuscule size. So what I want to see is that dye filling up the bladder wall and just see if it's leaking out from anywhere. I hope that there's an obvious tear in the bladder and we can go in and repair it. That's flowing, it's flowing, it's flowing. X-rays. Let's turn him on his back and rotate him to get more dye. And as we take more and more x-rays, I'm feeling even more concerned because it, I'm not seeing what I want to see. I actually want to see a tear in the bladder because I know I can go in and I know I can fix that today. But it's filling nicely, there aren't any leakages, so now I'm even more confused. I'm going to say let's inject another 0.2. I'm going to inject half first. Yep. <laughs> oh no. So I look up in the monitor and I can see his heart's dropping and it's dropping really low and I go into panic mode. We need to stop everything we're doing. No, I'm just giving her atropine to try and get his heart rate up again. Oh baby, baby. Oh, it's going up. Yeah, the heart rate's going up slowly. Just keep the oxygen on though. Yeah, bit of a scare. Baby anaesthetic, it's always scary. Yeah. 
he did really well until just now. Alright, once he comes back, I might do another VD and then I'm going to flush all the contrast out. Whenever you're doing an anaesthetic and you're concentrating on what you have to do and then there's an anaesthetic complication, there's a lot of pressure because you're trying to do the procedure, you're trying to get the anaesthetic stable and at the back of my mind I'm just seeing Zarima, you know, really holding on to little boy and he means everything to her. So there's so much pressure in an emergency situation. I'm feeling a bit sad because it means that I can't fix him uh, and I don't know if we can fix him. So I'm hoping the specialists at SASH can, can do their magic. Um, and help this little guy because he's been through so much. Oh, he's done really well. Come on in, come have a look at your boy. Oh, hello. Look who's here. Oh. Hello. He's going ready. But Zarima and little boy's joyful reunion is cut short with the news that the kitten's future is still uncertain. So the x-rays showed that the bladder does fill up with contrast or the stain that we put in and I can see the nice balloon of the bladder and I can actually see you know the tube where it comes out through his penis I can see all of that looks great there's no leakages there so then the question's coming where where is it coming from I honestly don't know what to think we were hoping it would be as simple as you know it's not simple but perhaps a bladder tear a tear in the bladder or something that we could repair but at the moment we you know there's a big question mark we don't know exactly what it is and I guess that's what's that's kind of what I was afraid of. I love you. Chicken, what are we gonna do with you? Hi Zareem. Oh, Hi, hello. I'm Andrew. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Lovely to meet you. Hello. This this is little boy. It is. Hello little boy. Here kitty cat. What's all hello? Ow! You got me already. <gasps> Zarima and little boy have now arrived at Sash for a consult with specialist surgeon Andrew Machevsky. He's quite bright, and you know, in a way, you just if a cat's got all this urine in his tummy, he really should be much sicker. I guess the possibility is because it's been there for literally half his life. Maybe mm. he's just thinking, well, that's that's my life. <laughs> oh, hello. Oh. Yeah, and that's my life and okay and they get on so you might have adapted to it. An ultrasound is a really easy way to get have a look inside. Don't need to anaesthetize him, don't need to sedate him and if we see some fluid we can get a sample. I'm definitely happy that he's in your care Great. and he's in everyone's care yeah. and I think he can feel that too because he yeah. won't stop purring no. and playing and I think he likes all of you because he knows that you're going to help him. I don't think you'll get it anywhere near the nurses because I'm going to carry you around because I could put you in my pocket. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you. Talk to you Thank soon. You, Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Come on, little boy. Where are you going? We'll get you sorted. I guess what we're trying to find out with little boy is, you know, has he still got fluid in his tummy? And if he has, what that fluid is. Because if it's urine, he's in a heap of trouble. You can't like imagine anyone living life having fluid constantly building up in their abdomen all over. So I'm just, I am scared. Oh, there's some urine in it. A little bit of urine, yeah. Ah, oh, little boy. All right, good Real wiggle puss. Do you think that's an amount you'd be able to sample? But as little boy's ultrasound gets underway, the results are not what anyone was expecting. So have you seen anything with the left kidney that looks concerning? No. 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 I'm looking at this ultrasound and the first thing that strikes me is there's not a huge amount of fluid in there. I just, I don't think there's much going on and the bits that I can see of his kidneys, they look okay. So it's really kind of exciting. I think really from my point of view, it's just there's no fluid there, which considering what it was a few days yeah. ago is great. So given what we're seeing on the ultrasound, he might actually be okay. You know, I, I don't think he's going to need surgery. Hello. How are you going? <laughs> Come on inside Hi. and we'll have a chat. Hi. So first and foremost, the ultrasound showed there is no fluid in there. Anymore? None. It's gone. It's gone. It's gone? It's gone. Gone. Really? All yeah, no, no, gone? no. Yeah, it's all gone. <laughs> He'd had a major trauma and it had been there a while and was just all irritated and the fluid was building up. And now with the you know, tincture of time and TLC, 
It's gone. It, it's I can't great. believe it. The best it. news, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I honestly, I, I cannot believe it because so many times I've been told, you know, it's time to say goodbye. Mm. Everything's going to be okay, okay? The moment I got him, I knew, I was like, I could never let you go. That's why you have to make it through. And he showed us that he wants to. Good people have looked after you. Yes? He's so full of life. <laughs> Oh gosh, such good news, oh, I can't no. wait to see it. Three days later, and Audrey is checking up on her miracle patient. Do you know all the heartbreak you've been causing everybody? So little boy looks completely happy and normal today. He's running around. You wouldn't even know all the trauma that he's been through. And your hair's growing back. <laughs> your hair's growing back. Look at that, gosh, his belly is back to normal. Hey, our little fighter boy. Been eating and drinking well. Going to the toilet okay? Yes. Yeah. When he drinks, he puts his paws on top, like, and leaps, and yeah. then drinks it in the bowl because it's yeah. just the size of him. I just can't believe how lucky you are. Yeah. We can't believe it. A miracle boy. <laughs> I'm gonna leave him with you. Yeah. <laughs> Come here, baby. Enjoy the rest of his. <laughs> week until I see you next time. <laughs> oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> Alright, bye bye cheeky face. Hey, Alright, here's Zarima. Zarima. I think little boy is the luckiest cat that ever lived. He's got Zarima who loves him to death, would do anything to help him, you know, get through this. And I think it's because of all her love and tender loving care that he's actually pulled through and I think he's come to the right place. I feel like it was all just a big blur, you know, when things happen so quickly and just lose track of things and I just think all the all the tears and all the all the pain and the sleepless nights and like did that actually happen because he's presenting like completely fine now it's like you know <laughs> it's unbelievable Tim from the Australian Reptile Park has given me a call because he's concerned about a baby wombat called Kenny. Now, all he's saying is that Kenny has a mysterious problem. So I'm on my way there now. Let's see if I can help out. Kenny was found on the side of the road after his mum was killed by a car. Over the past month, Tim has been his foster dad hand rearing him. He's recovered really well from his original problems and he's been feeding well, he's hydrated and everything's been great. But something happened yesterday that really scared me, and that's why I've called the vet. G'day, mate. How are you, mate? Good, how are you? There's that little mate. That's quite incredible. Look at you. He really scared me yesterday. Takes a bit to scare you. What did he do? Well, the day started out normal. So we got up, had a bottle, bit of a cuddle like this. He slept for a few hours, so I got him back up. I took him for a walk, his first walk, because until now he's been settling and in an artificial environment. Went for a walk, brought him back, and he just blew up. His eyes swelled up, his hands swelled up, around his neck went all red. I really have no idea what it could be. I don't know whether he's been bitten by an insect or um, it would seem that something triggered it, but I've got no idea. Have you got any photos of how he looked? I've got, yep, one. Look at his eyes. Yeah, wow. And that was mirrored under his chin, on his belly, and his hands. If Kenny was a dog or a cat, you'd be thinking maybe he's been bitten by a bee or maybe he's eaten something that wasn't quite right, or he's come in contact with a chemical. I mean, he, it was his whole face and his paws and everything, and I was freaking out that he was going to stop breathing. Mm. I think, Timmy, the only thing to do... Yep. ..is to take him back to the scene of the crime. Yep. Back to where it happened. I thought you'd say that. And let's have a look at what's around there yep. and make sure there's nothing that we, we're missing. Yep. As a vet in this day and age, you can run all sorts of tests, ultrasounds, MRI, CT scans, blood tests, you name it. But this test, maybe the most important for Kenny, it's a walk. 
Come on, little man. This is the same track as yesterday. Yeah, same way. Come on, Kenny. Yep, he's hot on your heels. So the funny thing is, we haven't gone over any ants' nests. No. I haven't seen one bee. No. It's just been grass. Yep. And this is the longest bit. I brought him in here, just in the fern and grass, and he loved it. He had a good play. You can see straight away, he really enjoys this, doesn't he? But that was the extent of the walk. Mm. I'm starting to think that today we're really not going to see anything of interest. Come on, Kenny. When, all of a sudden, Kenny just doesn't seem to be keeping up like he was before. He seems a bit clumsy, and then I look at his eyes, and they're different. Yeah, look at that. Oh, it makes my eyes water. He's hot all over, his ears are puffy. His eyes are really small. Eyes. What are you, man? His feet are getting really puffy too. I mean, look at those. What's really concerning me is that he looks sore, irritated, and I don't know the extent of this reaction. If we can see this on the outside, what's happening on the inside? That's scary. The worry I've got is that it looks like his body is now experiencing quite a significant reaction. If this continues at this rate, it could be very dangerous. Yeah, look at that. Oh. You can feel he's quite hot. His ears are really thick now. His eyes are swollen. Yeah. His feet are, are very puffy. So his reaction is actually happening right now. OK. You just hold on to him there. Allergic reactions become life-threatening when it starts to affect your airways. So the important thing right now is to put the stethoscope on and listen to Kenny's lungs. His heart rate and also his, his respiratory rate are actually quite high. That's from chasing after us on the walk, but yeah. also his whole body the mum is going through a, a big reaction. Yeah, he's, I can feel he's hot. Mm. So we need to work out exactly what he's allergic to yeah. that's causing that. But in the meantime, let's actually give him an injection straight okay. away because I just don't want this to get worse. The reaction's happening, but different to yesterday, Chris is here and he's got an injection, it's an antihistamine, and that'll slow this thing down. So just, yeah, that's perfect. So we'll just go between the shoulder blades here. Yep. You know from humans and bee stings, the fact that the first one is often bad, but the ones after that can be even more severe. If Kenny is like that and these reactions are getting worse with time, we need to treat him right now, otherwise this could become fatal. Hold still, buddy. Hold still. You look at where this reaction's taken place, it's around his feet, around his face, around his ears. Yeah. You look at the way wombats walk, obviously with their feet, and the head goes through everything first. Yes. So this is a contact allergy. It's not something he's breathing in, like someone that experiences hay fever or asthma. Yes. It's something he's actually coming into contact with, because this is what hits things yeah. first. Yep, makes sense. OK, so let's... That's scary. I'm just going to wash it off him. Yeah. Jeez, uh, his eyes are closed yeah. now. The antihistamine injection and the wipe down have certainly bought Kenny some time, but they've also bought me some time. They've given me a chance to go back through that walk step by step to work out exactly what Kenny came into contact with. And there's really only one thing. Hang on, man. Over the years, I've had to unleash a fair few surprises on Tim, but this one today might be the biggest one yet. You can see that everywhere right now, he's really irritated. Yeah. And you've got to feel for him. That must be an incredibly uncomfortable thing yeah. to go through. What if Kenny was a wombat that was allergic to grass? How can a wombat be allergic to grass? Exactly. It's like a dolphin that's allergic to water. Exactly. Does it really exist? Yeah. Ironically, the one thing that Kenny can't live without is the one thing right now he needs to live without. When his mum was hit by a car, all of a sudden his life changed. Yes. And he was no longer in the pouch. He's yeah. had to be hand raised. Yes. So he's never really been around grass. Yep except for the yep. walk yesterday yep. and the walk today. I've reared a number of wombats, and some of them from sizes much smaller than Kenny. And each time that I've introduced them to grass, they've been fine. I'm left speechless with Kenny. How can he be allergic to grass? Kenny has lived that clean life. Because Sorry, mate. he's had to be hand-raised by you. You've yep. done everything right. Yep. But in the process, he just hasn't come into contact with Yep this stuff. Does that mean he has to get used to it and he'll get better or is this going to get worse? There's no way Kenny can live his life without grass so he needs to find a way to live with it and that's where my plan comes in. There's a way we can do it but I reckon the most important thing right now let's get him off the grass. Yeah. Back to somewhere nice and cool. Okay. And recover. Yep. So away from the grass and with that injection I reckon he's going to be looking a lot better. Yeah. Oh he looks See? much better. 
straight away settle down. As far as I know, Kenny is the first wombat that's ever had an allergy to grass. So we're kind of breaking new ground when it comes to his solution. What we're gonna do is take a preemptive strike yep. on his allergy. Yep. Allergies essentially work the same way whether you're a wombat, a dog, a cat, or a human. So the solution centers around that theory. And rather than him having less walks, I yeah. want him to have more walks. Righto. But the walks are gonna be shorter. Yep. And he's only gonna go out to the grass for a few minutes at a time. Okay. And what you're gonna do before that is give him a quarter of one of these tablets. Yep. Brush that up into a powder. The way we're gonna deal with it is with antihistamine tablets. It stops his body from overreacting and producing all those histamines which cause that reaction. And put that into his milk. Just like You're that. You're about to lose it, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, I took a hay fever tablet this morning. <laughs> I'm not allergic to grass, but yeah, I did. So, if you guys have the same ritual, yeah. then it's perfect. So we go to sleep together, we wake up together, we medicate together. Well, it's the proper family unit, isn't it? Kenny and Tim will both have their next lot of antihistamines tomorrow. Right now, it's Chris's turn to play mum. Would you like to do the honours? I'd love to. Kenny's a pretty simple little character. He loves his bottle and he loves his walks. And now, hopefully, with his tablet, he might even learn to love grass as well. You think he's going to take the medicine all right? <laughs> what do you reckon? Yeah, I didn't think there'd be any problems. I like what you suggested. I think we've got a plan now that means he can still be around grass, yep. but can hopefully overcome the allergy as well. Yep. You ready? Into the bottle. Next morning at the Australian Reptile Park, Kenny is about to get his first dose of medication. All right, mate. There's yours. Here's mine. Time for some milk and antihistamine. Oh. Chris's instruction was Kenny needs to have his antihistamine in the morning with his bottle and then wait an hour and we can go for a walk. An hour later, it's time for the big test. Tim is anxious to see if Chris's prescribed antihistamine treatment will prevent Kenny's allergic reaction to grass. Come on, buddy, let's go for a walk. Come on. The path we're taking today is identical to the path I took yesterday when Kenny had the reaction. Come on, Kenny. Kenny's just been for a five-minute walk on the grass, and we've got a tiny reaction in the corner of the eye, but nothing compared to when Chris is here. I'd have to say the antihistamines are working. A delighted Tim is now heading home to share the good news with a couple of Kenny's little buddies. I think he missed you. Wombats, it's got to be my favourite because they're real individuals, real personality and character, and even though I love lots of other marsupials, some of them just lack that, and I don't know what it is about them, but they're really rewarding to care for. Take him for a run around the kitchen, please. He can just play with the boys. They love him, they exercise him, they keep him active, they give him his bottles, it's good for him, and it's good for them. Kenny will stay with Tim's family until he's weaned. Then his permanent home will be with the other wombats at the reptile park. Can he go on grass? He can go on grass. Hi. How are you? Come in, come in. Let's have a look. Um, they're upstairs, yeah. so it's all the way up to the third floor. Chris has been called out by Barry from Wires Wildlife Rescue to help a stranded family. He doesn't like me being here, she's keeping a very close eye. A mother duck and her nine newly hatched ducklings are trapped on a third floor balcony. There's no food, water or protection from predators. Sooner or later someone's going to have to feed them and I don't know what to feed them so that I'd ring you guys. <laughs> oh, here we go. A bit of eggshell there, but look at this. A nest. Oh, amazing. So they've obviously hatched out here, and not, popped up here, yeah, and jumped down there. And still not hurt themselves. And still not hurt themselves. It's very common for ducks to decide to have their eggs by a swimming pool and then try to raise the ducklings in the swimming pool. But you very rarely see it three or fours above a swimming pool. She's got close, but not quite close enough. There's only one place for them to go, and that's three floors down. 
and I don't think they're going to survive that fall. Without shade, the ducklings will quickly dehydrate and die. Thanks, Barry. So let's get it come to the side of the, of the net. The family needs an urgent change of address. I'll come in from here and from above. Okay, good. Got to hope a maternal instinct takes over and she doesn't want to get away from us. Chris is closing in on the mother duck and her nine ducklings trapped on a third story balcony. It's critical to catch mum first so she doesn't fly off and abandon her babies. Good one. After a struggle, Chris secures the mother. It's all right. It's all right. But she's not quite finished yet. She had a fair bit of fight. Obviously the kids aren't really, you know, wearing her out just yet. Big hands can be very handy. <laughs> the anxious mother and ducklings are now off to the Bondi clinic for a health check. You can see just how far away they are from, from flying. That's their wing. It's tiny. At the Bondi Clinic, Chris is giving the noisy ducklings one last examination. Chris rescued the nine newborns and their mother from their dangerous home on a high-rise balcony. They're so small, they are very vulnerable, and they're going to need to swim and, and run away from predators and going to have to keep up with mum. I think your legs are working OK, aren't they? Mum's quite confused. You can hear her just making a few little noises, almost talking to her babies, just saying, guys, you OK? I can hear you. You're distressed. Oh, oh, hello. And each time she makes a noise, they make a louder one back. Let's keep it down a notch. When Chris gets Mum out, she's not happy. What was I saying? Hey, hey, strong, eh? Just feeling it there, and she's actually in pretty good condition. The mother duck is ready to take her brood back to the wild, but there are no guarantees about their future. I am actually a little bit nervous about the release. Sure, they're fit, they're healthy, they're ready to go, but the harsh reality is I can't really control what happens out there in that pond. They are going to need some luck. Let's hope they've got it. Pretty spot. Beautiful. A fair bit of cover and so on. Yeah, so if they don't really like in the water, they can always come out through here. Chris and Barry from Wires are at a park to return the rescued ducks to the wild. What's good about this is that it's not too overpopulated with birds. There are no predators of there, so all the species here are pretty placid. They should welcome our new additions with open arms. Oh, that's their first ever time they've been in water and they're amazing swimmers. It's incredible, isn't it? So now it's the moment of truth as Chris anxiously watches the new residents settle in. Oh, a bit of a scuffle. Oh, jeez. They're actually attacking them. Hey. There's obviously a massive territorial battle going on. The worry is that one of those bigger ducks will actually have a go at one of the ducklings and one good peck could really seriously damage one of those ducklings or even kill it. Should they try to drown it? Give them something back though. The mother duck is fighting for her family. Go mum. Adopted a bit of a defensive position for her. All of a sudden, the attack ends. Amazingly, Several other adult ducks have stepped in to help protect the newcomers. For some reason, they're bonded with her instantly, and you know they're really helping her out. It's good to see. It just shows you just how strong her maternal instincts is. She's willing to fight as strong as she possibly can just to protect them. For those ducklings, she's the best ally they could ever hope for. Hi, I'm Dr. Danny Busek. If you love our show and want to see more amazing stories from the Bondi Vet team, just hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you for our next video.